Amen. So glad you're here. Hebrews chapter 8, if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn to Hebrews in the New Testament. If you're not familiar with where Hebrews is, uh, just kind of get towards the end of the New Testament. If you get to James, you've gone a little bit too far. Turn back to the left. Hebrews chapter 8 is where we'll be this morning. We continue in our series in Hebrews. Believe it or not, this is week 9 into our series. So if you've missed a few or you've missed maybe more than a few and you need to catch up, those are on our website. I encourage you to go back and, and listen to some of those. Hebrews chapter 9, starting with verse uh, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. We're going to read to the end of the chapter. Don't worry, it's 13 verses. Just stay with me. If you don't have your Bible, uh, the verses will be on the screen behind me. But let's read together. Hebrews chapter 8, with verse, verses 1 through 13. Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest. Let me stop there because you may think, well, what's he talking about? Well, chapter 7 was all about Melchizedek, high priest, Jesus being a better high priest. So he's picking up with that thought. Who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to make or about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, and this quotation is from Jeremiah 31, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. I will not be like the covenant I made, or it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I, will know, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Let's pray together. God, I do thank you for the opportunity to talk this morning and understand this morning. Maybe some things that have happened this past week that have brought so many emotions, so many anxieties to the surface. Uh, All of us in the room, as Brian just said, all of us in the room have been impacted one way or another through or by this storm. Many are still being impacted by the storm and will be for the foreseeable future. I pray as we talk about that a little bit this morning that you help bring some uh, clarity, you help encourage us, you help us understand as much as we can that in the times where things seem to be literally washing away, you are steadfast, you are our cornerstone, we can hold fast to you. I also pray as we look at Old and New Covenant, God, that you would help us understand what those two things are, how they impact our life, and what it means for those of us who know you to live under a new covenant, and how we can trust in you and the sacrifice you made and the mediator of a new covenant that you established for our right relationship with God. I just pray that you would bring clarity there. You would help us today to understand what those mean. Help me to be clear in what I say, but more importantly, God, help us to hear your word. Let it be made clear to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to make a couple of uh, really announcements and then take a few minutes at the beginning of our time, and this is a little different than normal, but I, uh, this has not been a normal week 
uh, for most of us. Um, and, and of course, anytime, you know, I sit down and like, oh gosh, she's sitting down. What's that mean? So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to have a minute together, uh, as we get started. But first, let me say this. So you received, many of you received, if not all of you received, uh, what we call a deacon nomination on the way in a little slip of paper where you can uh, nominate up to three as first Timothy three says, and this is where we get our qualifications for deacons up to three men of noble character of godly character. And so if you're a part of Upstate Church uh, and you would like to nominate three to represent the Malden campus, Larry Teague, who has been our deacon here for the last three years, is rotating off. Uh, And if you know Larry and his ministry, he has been a godsend to this campus and to me personally. And I'm so grateful for Larry and his ministry. But there is now opportunity for us to nominate three other men of noble character, men of godly character, uh, as Scripture tells us, uh, for us to have as deacon representative. We wanted to make sure you knew that. You can nominate up to three and um, then turn that in at the end of the service, and I'll give you direction at the end of the service on, on how to do that and when to do that. So that's first, deacon nomination. Secondly, getting to know you was scheduled for tonight. You may have already gotten a notice if you've been registered for that, but that has been canceled and we're doing the one in November. So I'd love for you to sign up. If you were signed up for that, we've already put you in November, November the 10th, but we'd love for you to come. November the 10th is when the next one will be, but because of everything going on, um, we just didn't feel like it would be good to, to, or, or right even to have that tonight. So that's been rescheduled to November the 10th. So those are, those are two things there that I wanted to bring to our attention. Now, for the next few minutes, I hope it's just a few minutes because I got some things I need to get to in Hebrews chapter eight. But I do, I do, I told the team this morning as we were meeting, uh, preparing for the service, I do feel like it's important when you go through a week like we've just been through to try to put some words to, to what we've experienced, to try to have a bit of a conversation about, about how, and, and we're still in the midst of it, how do we understand as much as we can in this moment, all that we've seen, all that we've been through, all that still has to happen. So I think it's really important for us to maybe have some affirmation in this space this morning, some conversation about what's going on, putting some language maybe to some feelings and some uh, thoughts that you have had about the events this past week. So I'm going to take a minute and do some of that, and then we'll jump in to the, to, the, to the passage this morning and talk about Old and New Covenant. But I, for me, in my purposes, I put down just some words and phrases that God really, uh, you know, when you're sitting in, when, like many of you, when you're sitting in your chair in your home and uh, you, you, you can hear only the crickets outside or the birds chirping because there's nothing on, right? Nothing else is running. What else are you going to do? You know, I just start thinking about, God, what are you what are you doing, God? What are you saying? What things are going on? Because if, if I don't have power and, and things aren't going on in my house, it doesn't mean God is not on the throne. It doesn't mean God has vacated. And some of you may think that your anxiety level may be out of the roof because of what you've seen this week. And you feel like, how could God ever? Why did God allow? Now, today is not an apologetic on to explain why God allows those things in the world to happen. We don't have time for that, but I think it's important for us to affirm this truth, if nothing else. We have a God who is in control, sovereign over all things, when things are going extremely well in the world and when things are are seemingly out of control and chaotic and destructive. He hasn't moved off of his throne. He is still in control of those things And when you and I have the temptation, when we see things like this week happen, to actually say or try to explain it in some other way that does not involve God in that, then here's what I can say. We actually remove God from that throne of authority and power in our life. And in that sense, you're not serving the one true God. If if the only time you serve God is when things are going well, if the only time you exalt him is when things are great in your life, but yet you actually try to find another way to explain things in the world when they're going chaotic and they're terrible, you don't really serve God. You're not serving him. He, in that sense, is serving you, which means you don't serve the one true God at all. Let me explain that this way. If in my relationship with my wife, Carrie, if the only time I ever talked to her is when things were going well, what kind of relationship do you think she and I would have? We wouldn't have one, right? Wives in the room, I said it already, you, none. You wouldn't have a relationship, right? I don't recognize my relationship to Carrie only when things are going well, 
only when things are great. Only, I recognize, in fact, the, 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 the seed in the, in the center of our relationship is built on that, those moments where actually we're going through things that are so difficult we can't explain it, but we hold to one another. And some of you this week have actually done that. You've held to one another when things seem to be just washing away, literally. These were the words, and I just put down some words that came to mind as I was thinking through this week to try to put a little language to it. When I started to, to see what happened this week, here were, here were the first things that come to mind is loss. And so many people have lost so much this week. And some have lost, many have lost the ultimate. They've lost lives. They've lost family members. Things that can't be replaced. Things that you can't build back. If it's not that, they've lost homes. And we've also seen entire communities and towns washed away. So loss is the first word that comes to mind. The second one is just carnage, right? When you watch TV and you see the reports, you just see a town that was there thriving. Brian mentioned Black Mountain. Just a few months ago, Carrie and I went up to Biltmore Village. And then, and then we see on the TV just carnage, just washed away, piled up in heaps, just destroyed. Nothing left. And then I, and then I thought of, of total destruction. Some people use these phrases, maybe you did, to describe it, war zone. Right? I heard that phrase over and over and over again this week when people were describing what was happening. Or even apocalyptic. Right? The, the end of time kind of things. When they see this kind of destruction. The last word that came to mind is desperation. Because I saw and heard stories of people who are just and still are in such desperate situations, cut off from everything and everybody, can't get out to anyone, and no one can come in to where they are. And you hear story after story after story of people who are totally dependent on someone else to come in and help them with their most desperate situation. The image, they're, they're, they're a tons of images that come to mind and I'm sure if you've been watching or hearing you have stories that you've heard that really resonated with you or uh, one that for me when the flood waters were so high I heard of people going in on boats to try to find and rescue right that was the only way you could get in to to some of these places is by boat and and one particular rescue boat pulls up to a house or motors up to a house and and they don't see anyone there they're looking on the roof and then they look over by the roof where the where the attic actually was vent, vented and they saw hands sticking out of it reaching out still alive barely but they got as high as they could and so they were rescued that was just one image that stood out to me as i was thinking through this past week and the desperation that people were in are in and I love the fact that we have a church that has such an outpouring heart where they go and they, they help and they send and they give. And many of you have done that, whether it's to North Carolina or whether it's across the street to your neighbor. Many of you have done that. I've talked to, to many of you just this morning who said we had power. We invited our neighbors or we invited friends to come over and just charge phones. Just have a hot shower. Amen to that, right? If you go for a while with that, taking those cold showers are tough, right? But inviting them into the home, just being a neighbor, being a friend. I love that we have people like that who open their home up and invite them in. But the word that stood out to all, among, among all of those to me was desperation. And that led me to start to think about the other side of it. We see the desperation, but then as the floodwaters start to recede, you, you begin to see people move and, 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 and began to organize themselves to go and help. And here's the words that started to come to mind. So you, you see the condition, and then you begin to see the response. Right? You see the desperation, and then you see, begin to see, and a lot of times in these situations, the church, God's people stepping up and moving in. Right? You see the response, and this is the, the words that came to mind, the, the determination, the resolve of people to get in and help. I think I even saw some, well, I know I did, I saw some reports of people going in through the mountains on donkeys because that's the only way they could go. Roads were washed out. The only way you could get to people is through that way, riding don the, the resolve and determination of people to help. The other words that came to mind, generosity, the outpouring, even when people had lost, even when people didn't have power, even when people couldn't get gas in their car, sending, going, giving to help others who are in more desperate situations. 
Rescue, I just talked about one where some come up on boats, others in helicopters, some of those places so remote or roads completely washed out where you couldn't get to them. The only way is by donkey or maybe coming in by helicopter. And then the the last word that came to mind as I'm thinking about that response of our people to those situations is selfless and sacrifice, giving of themselves, sacrificial, selfless. Some, may call, some of you may be called this week. Some of you, because I know looking around the room, you're first responders or you're on the front lines. You've already been doing it. You've already been working. You've already been cutting away some of those trees and, and rescuing people and I'm thankful for you. Every time I see one of those, those electric, electric trucks with those linemen or women going by, man, thank you, Lord, for them and what they're doing. But you may be called even this week to step in and to help or at least to offer and to be generous, and to rescue those who may be in a desperate situation. Here's what I thought about, and then we're going to connect it to this morning, because there is a connection. As I was making these thoughts and putting these thoughts down this morning, I wrote this out, in their desperate need, they cried out for hope, and hope arrived. In their most desperate situation, clinging on literally to rocks and boulders or trees, those are some of the reports we get of people needing to be rescued. Literally climbing up in trees, holding onto trees, or holding onto rocks so they won't get washed away. And being rescued from that. In their desperate need, they cried out for hope, and hope arrived. And hope came. In this situation, in the form of good Samaritans and people coming in in boats and helicopters to help and give. But hope arrived. Hope came. I love the Psalms, Psalms 116. It talks about this where it says, I love the Lord. This really gets to what we're talking about this morning. I love the Lord, why? Because he heard my cry when I called out to him. And in my desperate need, he saved me. He lifted me up. And that's the God we serve. So this morning, if you're thinking through, especially I look around the room and I see a lot of students, I see a lot of young adults here. Not that that doesn't affect us all, but maybe some of you are really wrestling through this whole idea of why did God let that happen. Let me just encourage you, let this be your first response. Don't lose your grip on the only one who doesn't change. Hebrews, we'll study it a little bit later. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The, literally, the mountains may wash away. Isaiah talks about it. We read about it in, in Revelation. The mountains may wash away and fall into the sea, but he always stands. He's never washed away. And so let that be your first response as you work through, man, why is all this happening? But don't let it keep you on the sidelines either. As you're considering that, jump in, because that may be exactly what God wants to do, is to get you in the game, to serve, to give, to help where you can. So as we're talking about this and we're thinking about specifically the old covenant, And what the old covenant means, here's the thing I would say to you regarding the old covenant, and we're talking about desperation, right? The old covenant does this if it does nothing else. As we look at things like the devastation of Helene, uh, the old covenant points out the enormous gaps between where you and I need to be and the, the effort and the power you and I have to get there, spiritually speaking. There's no one in this room. In fact, if anybody in this room fits this category, I'd love for you to raise your hand. Is anybody in the room perfect? Didn't think so. I didn't raise mine either. No one in this room is going to live a perfect life. There's only one who did. You and I stand in need, and you may not recognize it this way, but it's a desperate need spiritually. It's a life and death issue spiritually. You and I, if we don't know Christ, stand in the place of judgment, God's judgment, God's wrath. There's no way for me to make that right. There's only one who lived a life, gave his life, created and established a new covenant under which I now can stand in front of and in the presence of God. And it's through Christ and it's through his blood and it's through what he has done, not what I can do. When I look at... The, 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 the devastation and the desperation that we just noticed this past week. Here's some things that also came to mind. Sometimes you forget how good you have it until it's gone, right? I mean, all of us, hopefully, at some point this week, maybe you're still doing it, you recognize that's the case. I remember many times as I walked into a dark room and I flipped a switch. I don't know if you did that. I did it all the time. 
flipping a switch, hoping something would come on or not even realizing it, but nothing happened. I could have flipped that switch all day. Guess what was going to happen? There would be no light coming on, right? There was nothing to it to power that light. It was just a switch flipped up and down. Everything necessary for that switch to work, which is to turn on some power, was cut off. Nothing could get to it. I walked into that room and those rooms often only to realize that the switch had no power to turn the lights on. Now listen, what was needed was cut off. It was a reminder of what was required, power, electricity, yet was insufficient to provide. Okay, so that's where we're going with this conversation about Old Covenant and New Covenant. What the Old Covenant presented to us, revealed to us was this. God requires, because he's holy, a sinless person to stand in his presence. Otherwise, if you stand in his presence sinless, you would have died. Because he is holy and you are not. The Old Testament revealed that to us. The Old Covenant specifically revealed that to us. That there's nothing you, you will do. You will not follow those Ten Commandments perfectly every day for the rest of your life. In fact, some of us in the room may get one or two on our good days. But most days we fall way short of that standard. So what the old covenant pointed out, hey, I can't reach that. That's what I see. What does that mean? It didn't have any power to provide a remedy for. It could not help me with the problem it identified. It showed it to me. Hey, this is the standard. God gave it to Moses on tablets. That's the standard. There's no way I'm going to meet that. So what? The old covenant pointed it out but it was insufficient to provide the remedy for it. That's why the, Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews says that. Hey, there's a new one coming, and it's based on what? Better promises. There's one coming, and Jeremiah talked about it in Jeremiah 31. There's one coming, who, and, and when you trust in him, the gospel, and he brings that to your life, he'll write it on your mind and on your heart. So in other words, no longer would it be an external behavior, but it's an internal transformation that leads to external behavior what was needed was cut off it was a reminder of what was required yet it was insufficient to provide here's the big idea for the morning a better priest gives us a better covenant a better priest jesus also mediates for us a better covenant the preacher in hebrew in chapter 8 of hebrews makes two significant comparisons the ministry of the great high priest right and the mediator of a new covenant The whole time we've been studying through Hebrews, the idea has been to present Jesus, which is what he does, as better than. He is is better than the angels. We started out chapter one with that. And all the way through, he's compared Jesus to what they would trust in. He's better than all of that. Hold on to him. Don't drift. Hold fast. Now we get to chapter seven and eight. And he has this ministry of the great high priest and the mediator of a new covenant. Since Jesus is a better high priest, he is the mediator of a better covenant. And you may be asking this question. It's the question I asked. (coughs) Excuse me. What makes this covenant better? This is precisely the point of the preacher's comparison. This is why he's doing what he's doing. This is why he's laying it out the way he's laying it out. He makes the point clear when he compares the new covenant to the old. Think of it this way. The the illustration of the insufficiency of the light switch to switch on light, to turn light on. The insufficiency of the light switch without electricity illustrates the old covenant's insufficiency without the gospel's power to change lives. It will never, the old covenant, the old, as you see it in the Old Testament, the old covenant will never get us to a right relationship with God. Why? Because the old covenant has no power to transfer you, transform you internally. It's an external. It's not an internal. So the two points we have for this morning are, is, are these two. The old covenant first was insufficient. The old covenant was insufficient. If you still have your Bibles open, look in verse uh, 6 of Hebrews chapter 8. It says, but in fact, the ministry of Jesus has received, uh, has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. 
since the new covenant is established, and this is what I mentioned a while ago, on better promises, looking forward to something better. The preacher introduces significant comparisons in the first few verses of chapter 8. And to summarize it, it's these two. Christ's role as high priest, and then Christ as a mediator of a new covenant. Comparing the old with the new emphasizes how much better Jesus is than everything else. Now, again, how your mind works, this is how my mind works. Why was the old covenant insufficient? In other words, in what way was it insufficient? If, if preacher, you're saying that the old covenant, the Ten Commandments, those things that were given to Moses that the people should follow, if you're saying we should not live underneath that now, we're not bound to that now, it is insufficient. In what way was it insufficient? Let me, let me just say this. It was insuffi- insufficient because it only pointed out the gap that exists between man and God because of our sins. So the old covenant pointed out to you and I, when we read that, the Ten Commandments specifically, this is what God required. There's no way I can live up to that standard. And the old covenant pointed that out, yet it didn't provide any remedy to deal with the problem. It never actually provided a remedy for the issue. In order to be in right relationship with God and not experience his judgment for sin, one had to do perfectly all of God's commands. The old covenant required external adherence to the law. To do things, to live in such a way, to obey all the commands, to every day wake up and check all the boxes. Again, There is no way any of us in the room, there is no way anyone in history has ever done that. Yet, and this may be you, some of us in the room still live every day trying to outweigh good or the bad deeds with good deeds. We still live with a scale in mind that I've got to do more good things in my life than bad things. And then one day when this life is over, God will look at those things, the ledger will be in my favor, and he will let me in. The old covenant said there's no way you can live up to that, but yet it didn't provide a remedy to that. Listen, until you and I are aware of our need for Christ, until until you know how, we talked earlier about the scenes in North Carolina, until you understand how desperate spiritually you are, and many of you in the room have come to an understanding of that because you have a relationship with Christ, But until you understand how desperate you are, spiritually speaking, you're never going to reach out and ask for that kind of help. All you're going to do is have and tweak some behavior, right? Every now and then, some behavior modifications, some temporary external moral adjustments. When you begin to see things get kind of out of balance, when you see some old habits, pop back up after trying to put those away in your own power. You see them start to creep back in. All you and I do if we're living old covenant and not trusting in the power of God that has changed our life, you're trusting in something you can do. All you're going to do is actually make a couple of moral adjustments, kind of like taking the the turn or or the knob on the stereo or on the radio in your car and kind of turning it this way or turning it that way to adjust it a little bit. You're not living out of anything that has happened internally. That passionate desire to follow Christ. Why? Because you love him and he is changing your affections. And any of you in the room who have walked with Christ long enough understand what that means. And it sometimes takes years for those affections, for God to change those. Sometimes it happens in a moment. I remember my dad, I grew up with my dad. Thankfully, I didn't know him in, in, in um, and I mentioned this before, in this state. My dad was an alcoholic until he was 29 years old. And in a, uh, he, he, would, he would tell us these stories of he grew up as a bootlegger. Those of you who know what bootlegging is in South Georgia. So he would, he would bootleg uh, moonshine and and. All of his life, up until 29 years old, alcohol was a huge part of his life until a moment God encountered him. He had a Damascus Road experience. Not many of us have those, but he did. 
drinking a fifth of liquor a day. And then God in a moment breaks him and encounters Christ and God immediately for that affection changed it. And he never had a desire for another drop of alcohol the rest of his life. That kind of thing happens where God changes our affections immediately. But listen, there were a lot of other things that came along with that package that Ellis Moore, that's my dad, had in his life that God still to this day is still trying to work out in his life, right? Not all of it went away. But those affections begin to change in our life. Why? Because we're trying to follow, excuse me, try to follow some external, um, external law, external behavior and change it that way. No, because there's been a change internally. And we want to follow and we love God for that reason. Until you and I are aware of our need for Christ, those moral adjustments will continue. Let me summarize it this way and we'll do a point two really quick. God's standard of perfection conveyed in the Old Testament or in the Old Covenant specifically. Listen, that standard of perfection, it, it's not irrelevant. Jesus said, I came to, to fulfill it, not abolish it. That's what Jesus said. So not to do away with it. It's not, it's not irrelevant to us. There's a moral standard you and I should live by every day. It's still true today. You shouldn't go murder somebody. That's 10 commandment. We should follow those things. The difference is you can't put your trust in those things to actually bring you into a right relationship with God. Why? Because you're not going to do them all every day. You're going to fall short of those every day. God's standard of perfection conveyed in the old covenant is not irrelevant, but it is insufficient. And this is what I mean by it. It diagnoses the condition. It lets you know that you are far away from where you need to be in relationship with God, but it stops short of a solution. Okay, it diagnoses the condition, but it stops short of a solution. As I was walking through a dark house this week, the darkness was evident, but the standard way of resolving the issue and lighting the way was insufficient. I'd flip a switch and nothing would happen. I was cut off. It couldn't solve my problem. The old covenant will let you know things aren't as they should be. But it never really provides a solution for that issue. It can't provide the solution, hence the need for a new covenant. That takes us to the second point. The new covenant was sufficient, was sufficient. If you have your Bibles again, Hebrews 8, verses 10, and then 12 and 13, you can follow along. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. For I, will, for I will forgive their wickedness and love this promise, will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. The quotation from Jeremiah 31 that we have in this chapter, you may know this, you may not know this, that's the longest one in the entire New Testament. The longest one in the whole New Testament. Contained here in chapter 8, the promise from the prophet Jeremiah who lived and ministered under the old covenant is that the futility of an external standard, in other words, that old covenant, in its ability to make us right with God, is that the futility of an external standard in its ability to make men and women right with God, here's the reality of that, will be realized in only one way. When that law is then written on our hearts. When our hearts and our minds are infused with the power of the Spirit through the gospel, transforming us and creating in you and I a desire to follow. Paul on the sufficiency of the new covenant in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the whole chapter, you can go read that on yourself, is about that, but this is what he says. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us. We don't have the sufficiency. Here's what he says. Our sufficiency is from God. He is the one who does the work in me that creates in me this desire to want to follow him. That's the mark of a Christian. The mark of a Christian is not one who just follows external standards and never making anything in, uh, internal. That's, that's religion. And that's what Jesus uh, hammered people for in the New Testament. They are religious. Jesus called them what? Whitewashed tombs. They look good on the outside, but there's death inside. They're decaying. What the gospel is, 
is when it comes into our hearts, it transforms us from the inside out. And those behaviors start to show. We don't have that power in ourselves. It only comes from hearts transformed. So I'd say this about this transformation of this new covenant. Hearts changed by the gospel, because that's what happens. Hearts changed by the gospel lead to passionate obedience. Those who have been changed by the gospel internally, they have a passionate obedience to serve God and to do what God asks them to do. Does that mean they do it right every day? Absolutely not. Starting with your pastor. I don't do it right every day. I mess it up every day, but thank God for his grace. I'm not depending on my behavior to get me right with God. I've trusted in one, namely Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross that has made me right with God, as Paul says. He's reconciled me. He's made peace with God through Christ, not my efforts and not yours. You can't do it. But hearts that have been changed by the gospel lead to passion and obedience. Listen, the condition revealed by the old covenant finds its only remedy in the new covenant. It finds its only remedy in the new covenant. Paul Schreiner, a a New Testament commentator, says this. The Old Testament is God's authoritative word. Where the old covenant is found. The Old Testament is God's authoritative word. We don't disregard it as some popular pastors do even today from the pulpit. Saying the Old Testament doesn't have any bearing on us is false and it's heretical and I hope you don't listen to any of that. We do not cut the Bible in half giving the Old Testament away and only adhering to the new. That's not what scripture is all about and you will have a a, a heretical and a misunderstanding of scripture if you cut off the Old Testament. We should read the entire Bible in that light. The Old Testament had its purpose. It is authoritative. It is God's authoritative word. But he goes on, we must read the whole Bible covenantally. There is a covenant that God has created. It was old covenant. Now there is one that has come, a mediator of a new covenant. And under him, God writes his word now in our heart instead of on stone. That's what we lean into. More than lean into. That's what you have to trust in. Not your own effort, not your own ability. Bottom line, the new covenant accomplishes what the old covenant never could. The new covenant accomplishes what the old covenant never could. It's like a two-act play. You can't cut one away. That's uh, an illustration by a guy named uh, John Bright. It's a two-act play, if you looked at it that way. right? If you went into that play and you only caught the second act, you'd be lost. We understand scripture as a two-act play. The old covenant, it pointing out the need, letting us know what we need, and then the new covenant, Christ comes and brings us a remedy to our desperate situation. In him, through his sacrifice on the cross, hope emerges when our desperate condition is reversed by the sufficient sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. I have have this image in mind, uh, I'll close with this, of of, uh, one of the rescue operations. This past week, I saw a, a story done on a, a family that was in the mountains, and there's this open clearing there in the mountain. You may have seen the same story. Um, and at that point, people were only being reached by either mules going up the side of the mountain or by helicopter, airplane, whatever else. No other way to get to them. And it was, it was a story of a helicopter pilot who was flying over an area in the mountains, and there was just open clearing. And in the, out of the corner of his eye, he has this, this glare that he catches. And what they come to find out is there, there's this, I believe it was a lady down in that clearing with a mirror. And, and she couldn't get anywhere else. And she knew the only way that you could get to her and to whoever else was there to help was by air. And it just so happened. And I don't believe in just so happens or coincidence either. God led them, but it happened that this helicopter was coming by as she was flashing that mirror. It caught their eye. The helicopter descends and begins to meet their greatest need. They were cut off. There was no other way. They were going to receive the help they needed. The only way they could receive it was by helicopter, and that just so happened to be what came over and saw her signal for help. Listen, there, there's an old covenant that if we try to live by, it leads to death. Rules, regulations, religion, death. You'll never do it. It will never save you. There's a new covenant mediated by one who gave his life on a cross, and he invites you to do what? Call out to him. 
signal for help. You're cut off. There's no other way. There's no way out. You're in a desperate situation if you're here this morning and you don't know him. But the great thing about our Savior is this. He tells us if you call out to him, he'll hear you. And he'll answer. And he'll provide not just something you need, but exactly what you need. In order to redeem your life and change your life, you trust in him and not something that you can do because you're cut off from it. There's no way you can do it. But that invitation is to you today. If you don't know him, call out to him. He hears your voice. And he'll respond. You're in a desperate situation if you're here today and you don't know him. Call out to Christ, signal for help, and he'll hear you and come. God, I just thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity this morning to hear your word again and Hebrews and the covenant and all of that. And there may be a lot of that for people this morning who are here there to think, man, I, I'm still like clueless. It's even more confusing now than it was before the pastor started. So I pray that even in my ramblings, God, you're truth came through, through your word, not through something I've said. As your word is proclaimed, let it go out and find good soil and deep roots. And I pray this morning, if there are some here that, God, your conviction is heavy on their heart, whether it's the, the, what's happened this week has brought that to the surface, whatever it may be, God, but you're drawing them to yourself and you're, help them understand their desperate situation without you. There's only one way that they're able to be reconciled to God and at peace with, with God. And it's through the sacrifice of his son on the cross. God, give them the courage and the boldness they need in this moment to cry out to you and the encouragement to, the, to know, confidence to know that you will respond. Let them signal for help. Call out to you. And God, I know you'll respond. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.